thanks a lot, dear Ezri. We know each other since I don't know how many years, and I think we ran into each other when I was still studying, and we met in uh, Tel Aviv in, uh, on a design exhibition, and since then we exchanged so many ideas about uh, design and design research, and I'm really happy to, to be here. So um, my topic is about civic design for an inclusive digital society, and it really perfectly links to what you were mentioning and what we were also discussing yesterday evening about the role of technology and the responsibility that we all share when we are designing and creating new technologies. And thank you so much. And when we are thinking about um, social aspects of technology. And I will start with sharing some experiences that I made during my sabbatical. I was traveling uh, at the beginning of this year um, through South Africa, Ghana, Togo, and then I went on to China. And my question was the different perceptions and the different narrations about the digital society that maybe different African communities and countries share, and maybe in sharp contrast to Chinese versions of the digital society. And then my question was also, What's our role in between in Europe? So what's our vision of the digital society? And I will start with an image about Agobloshi. Agobloshi is the biggest e-waste dump all over the world. It is in Accra in Ghana, and it shows um, the worst side I've ever seen uh, in the world, and it's totally toxic. It's not a kind of just e-waste site, but it's like a city. It's a whole city. <laughs> Uh, based on rubbish, on e-waste, on old uh, computers, on fridge, fridges, on whatever stuff that you can find there. And people are living on this uh, site. And uh, they try to make any kind of use of those kind of leftover materials that we ship from all over the world to Africa and also from Europe, very much uh, stuff is brought there. So our old unused computers are donated to Africa and then they end up in Agobloshi. And it's, uh, it's like hell, so it's really, um, yeah. And people live on this site and they try to do a kind of whatever, recycling, upcycling, you know, reusing the stuff that is uh, dumped there. And this, of course, shows the consequences of the digital society in a very dystopian way. And um, so, of course, all the stuff that we are creating also maybe and ending up there because we don't think about sustainability. But at the same time, on this Agobloshi um, e-waste dump, there is a makerspace. So it is an uh, open source architecture. It's a kind of little container infrastructure that they were building. And uh, the vision of those young men that are creating the Agobloshi makerspace is to provide an infrastructure, to provide access to knowledge, to make better use of those leftover technologies. So they provide the tools, they provide open source technology and, and, uh, and, and sources to make a better upcycling process. And I love this image because it is, has these two sides. It has the dystopian side, but maybe also the utopian side. But in, in a way, of course, this Agroboshi makerspace has the narration saying, you know, we can, through access to technology, through digitization, we can make better use of our resources and we can make a change. And of course, it is very cumbersome. It is, you know, of course, not the solution for Agroboshi, but it's still some hope. It's creating some hope. Um, with all the kind of um, difficult uh, circumstances, for example, you know, who has access to these kinds of technology, who can use it, although it's standing there, you know, who is able to use open source technology to make better upcycling processes, and who understands this whole narration that also comes, of course, from the Silicon Valley, that uh, this is, you know, an, an, a wave to do digital innovation through maker culture. So it's not easy uh, to do this, but uh, still it is a first uh, attempt and a first step. And so open source is, uh, I think, a, um, a great network of, of communities of activist people who share their vision of this sharing society, sharing the tools, sharing the knowledge, sharing the resources. And there were some really impressive um, results also coming from this Agobloshi makerspace. So they were uh, creating, for example, um, an e 3D printer out of e-waste and making their own little repair culture uh, structures with this uh, 3D printer, for example. So this is an, an image that I want to start with, this kind of two sides of the digital society. 
So of course we're living in the digital age and I will compare the African countries with this hope for a better future through the mere access to digital technology and these innovation hubs and maker spaces that I was visiting in South Africa, Ghana and uh, Togo. And also this kind of narration of leapfrogging the industrial age, whether this would be true or not. So um, yeah, I doubt it's, that it's true. And then on the opposite side, we have China, and uh, I was visiting Tongji University in Shanghai, and we have a lot of debate in the media in, in Germany now, starting on understanding the whole scope of the social scoring system in China that collects and analyzes all possible data uh, from people. And we have this whole AI revolution taking up so fast in China. So this is really the opposite side that I was seeing there. And then, you know, what's our narration? So what do we share in terms of values, in terms of our vision of a sustainable future? So what's our role in these kinds of two contrasting uh, poles and oppositions in the digital society? So some examples uh, from my research visits in Africa. So what do we learn about innovation from African communities? I think this is a very important perspective. When we think about uh, M-Pesa that was invented, I think, more than 10 years ago in Kenya, and uh, where we in Europe are so slow at taking up on mobile payment services. So uh, still now in Germany, you cannot pay uh, usually with Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever. So we are so slow in adapting to those kinds of technologies. And they were just inventing uh, these kind of very easy um, services based on uh, SMS in principle, because there was a lack of infrastructure, because there were no banks, and so they had to find a solution for easy transfer of money. So this kind of scarce of uh, resources and the lack of infrastructure makes them, of course, also very inventive. So understand and learn about uh, innovation from African communities. And then, uh, indeed, the, the question, what's the potential of ICT for development in different African countries? So in Cape Town University, they are very much focusing on this ICT for D uh, programs and working together with different, for example, townships, communities to understand the question of how to get access to technology is not a technological question, but it's also very much a social question. So how do you raise awareness for the potentials of accessibilities, for the potentials uh, of all these kinds of digital tools that we have, and how to overcome the digital divide that is widening currently. It's widening in Europe, it's widening in the African countries, and we are producing more and more people who are just left behind and whom we exclude from all the kinds of digital benefits that we might share. And so some hypotheses um, from uh, my recent traveling. So they have, of course, this big maker and repair culture <coughs> that has a really lively scene, which I was seeing there. So um, in different uh, African countries, there's really a big network of fab labs and maker spaces now coming up also in, uh, in Accra. So um, I was visiting the Social Impact Hub, for example. It was a really good uh, example. <coughs> the Social Impact Hub in Accra is creating their own infrastructure Structure. So they are not, let's say, just an innovation hub where they share kind of co-working spaces, but they are creating their own energy supply because they had all these kinds of blackouts with no energy, so with no electricity. So they are creating solar panels for their own kind of independent energy supply. They were creating their own kind of uh, rental spaces uh, for the, for the um, innovators and for the co-working spaces because the rentals are too high in Accra. So they are also creating this infrastructure. And they, are also, they also give broadband access because also the, uh, the government does not provide internet access in an appropriate way and there are no big companies to provide internet access. So they kind of take over the role of a whole facilitator for a kind of bigger community to have the opportunity to do their innovation work that they want to do. So there's a huge um, a burden to really come up with all this infrastructure to get the ground, to get access to it, to have the ecosystem to really come up with innovation uh, in, this, in this sense. So, Lots of uh, barriers, a lot of things to do, but um, the network of those people is really uh, incredible. So I think that there's a huge potential in this kind of decentralized network, but um, this kind of narration that they can leapfrog towards uh, you know, digital society, this is just not the case. 
We have um, this, uh, the, the question of accessibility that I was mentioning. So um, many, many people in Africa go online through the mobile phone. So the mobile phone um, penetration is quite big. For example, um, in uh, South Africa, 84% uh, of the people have a mobile phone. And then you could say, well, that's quite good. You know, you have access to information, you have access to uh, the resources, and then you could start. But this is not the case because the data volume is so expensive that they just cannot afford to go online. So they have the hardware, but they ha have no access um, to, to the internet because of the pricing. So uh, ICT research, uh, research ICT Africa, it's a, a think tank, tank in Cape Town, and they are voting for, or they are, um, uh, yeah, doing a policy work for accessibility of the internet at a kind of low rate should be uh, for free for everybody. So that uh, there should be a basic right to access the internet. And I think this is a very fair point and very interesting in terms of thinking about closing the digital divide in uh, having this kind of basic right to access uh, the internet. So this is a kind of policy uh, term that I was taking with me also from my traveling. And this is a picture of the social impact hub that I was mentioning. And um, we have a way of a clash between this kind of um, also a bit overused term of the maker culture and of innovation that also comes with a more a neoliberal turn. You know, these innovators create this kind of new digital society and this kind of reality that we are facing there in, in Ghana and in Accra. And, uh, but they really want to have their own kind of access to the digital society and their own kind of designing of the digital society. For example, they make um, products for uh, cooking facilities. So they use uh, organic waste that they have and turn it into a certain form of gas. And this kind of gas is used for cooking. So really kind of local solutions that they are produced locally and they try to address their respective problems in the local communities. So very um, interesting bottom-up approaches to innovation. And we see a lot of debate about using technology to drive social change. So this was also the good part of my, uh, of my learning journey uh, to, uh, to the African countries. But this is uh, to, just a first step, just a first uh, glance of, uh, of the complexity of these kinds of um, technologies that are used, the communities that are engaged, and of the problems that arise. And from this uh, setting, I went to China. So, and that was a totally different story, of course, and this is what I call the totalitarian data regimes. And uh, traveling to China and spending some time there and then looking back at Europe, it was like Europe is a museum. So it's just like with these old traditions and it's beautiful to travel there, and it's beautiful to spend time there, but it's uh, so slow. And uh, I learned about uh, Chinese speed. So Chinese speed is very different. And I learned, for example, about the new life, uh, work-life balance model in China. And they told us, yeah, no, no, we stopped working so hard. You know, it's cumbersome. We also have families, so we also want to share some leisure time. And the new work-life um, uh, balance model is 996. And I was like, 996, what's it? Yeah, it's uh, now the new model is from nine to nine, six days a week. So this is the better model now. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So, so this was uh, my first impression of China. And then I went to visit some, um, some startups, some companies who are working on this uh, social credit uh, system. So Face++ Plus Plus is one of the biggest uh, startups that they are uh, around there in, in Beijing. And they do face detection. And you know all about the, the technology about face detection, so there was nothing new. But the implementation was uh, incredible, how they are doing it. So they have, of course, the different uh, applications there for intelligent access, so you enter a hotel lobby and you don't have to che check in or register at the counter, but your face is scanned, your ID is uh, stored, not just locally for the, for the hotel, but this is uh, connected to the kind of a public database with your face ID, and so your, your access is just guaranteed and you are welcomed uh, by name automatically, so it's, it's all there, so forget about <laughs> privacy. And um, it's very much about surveillance that is uh, implemented throughout all the bigger cities um, in an unbelievable matter, uh, a manner. So it is really uh, everywhere. 
And they are now, the, the, the very new thing that they implemented is expression analysis in the classroom. So there were some kind of debates about, uh, about school children who were complaining about uh, the teaching methods or who were um, you know, not so successful. And then they said, OK, we, we uh, solve this problem through AI. And so they do a, a real-time expression analysis of all the school children in the classroom. And if they are you know, not smiling or seem to be uh, a bit tired, so then the score is kind of going down. And also the score of the teacher is going down. You, know, you as a teacher evaluated you to the face expression uh, of, your, uh, of your school children. And, and they just try it out and they say, well, yeah, maybe if, if it's a useful tool, why not? And for us, it's like, well, what, what, what are you doing there? And the video surveillance is taking place uh, everywhere and it, it uh, raises the security in, the, um, public, in public space. That's how they argue about it. So it's much better if you have these kinds of surveillance technologies in place. And you might also have heard about these kind of traffic light um, systems where, where if you cross the, um, the traffic with a red light, then you know, your, the, uh, your picture is displayed on a big uh, public screen uh, and your score is going down. So it's uh, incredible, it's all there. It's yeah, you get the pen, yeah, 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 a melody, yeah, it's, it's all. And um, yeah, it's all there, it's not, it's not fiction, it's all there. And what's also a, a, a quite funny is uh, maybe you heard about this facial recognition payment system. So the mobile payment, of course, is the thing there, but now face payment is the next big thing. So with uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you can pay with your smile. That's their big uh, advertisement. So you just you know, order something, you stare at the screen, your face ID of, is, of course, stored uh, on the system. And if you smile, then uh, you, you pay with your smiling. So it's, uh, that's also already implemented. And, uh, and this kind of data collection is, is going insane. So for example, if you use uh, Sesame Credit that's based on the Alibaba platform with 400 million users, and this is also part of the social credit system. So uh, if you pay back the, the Sesame Credit uh, not in the uh, appropriate manner, your score is lowered. Um, it's also linked to the score of your close runs and your friends. So if your friends have a lower score, then also your score is lowered. And uh, it's also linked to your Didi profile, which is the uh, equivalent to Uber. So if you get a bad ranking as a driver or as a, uh, as a guest, um, you also get uh, lower uh, social credit points. And this is also linked to the um, dating platform by he. So if you want to have a new partner and your score is low, you also get suggestions from for uh, lower score partners on Baihi. So this is just, uh, yeah, it's just insane. There's one a quote from one of the developers of Sesame Technology, the director, and he said, someone who plays video games for 10 hours a day, for example, would be considered an idle person. Someone who frequently buys diapers would be considered as probably a parent who on balance is more likely to have a sense of responsibility. So your whole kind of attitude uh, online is kind of analyzed and then you are kind of ranked in this uh, in these system. So, um, and this is just the things that I know from a kind of desk research. So this is, uh, th this, this model of the social scoring system is uh, incredibly, um, what, what kind of data is linked to it. So they have a big DNA database, for example. They're building up a voice state detection database also so that you also get a voice ID so that your voice can also be singled out in a crowd so they can also link this uh, to the system. They have this credit history. They have emotion tracking in school and so on and so on. And the social credit system is implemented in 15 different regions now uh, throughout China and they want, that's uh, the plan, they want to implement it nationwide in China by 2020. So this is tomorrow. I don't know whether they will really um, be able to do it, but this is uh, the plan. So steering a whole kind of uh, country through this system, through this uh, data collection and scoring systems, is the plan. And there are just a few people opposing to it. Of course, maybe they would not oppose in public. But uh, many people say, well, it's transparent. It's, uh, it's a kind of control and security, and um, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, yeah, it is a good form of justice because you know good behavior, then you get 
better scoring points. And for bad behavior, behavior you get worse. So it's um, it's a totally understand different understanding of uh, of steering of uh, of openness. They don't have a sense of privacy in this uh, in this case. And um, we have no distinction between public and private, no distinction between government and company anymore, so all the kind of data uh, is uh, analyzed and collected um, in, in a single kind of uh, huge database. There is no right for privacy. Data sovereignty is, of course, not in place. And uh, this negative behavior is sanctioned uh, by the scoring system. So currently it is uh, done through travel restrictions and no access to public career paths, for example. So if you have a very low score, you cannot book flight tickets online, for example, because you have to uh, give your kind of social security number, you're identified and you cannot travel anymore. So uh, yeah, we see it is already there, this totalitarian data regime. And it was already uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, the former CEO of Google, uh, saying some time ago already, I don't believe society understands what happens when everything is available, knowable, and recorded by everyone all the time. Well, very true, <laughs> Mr. Eric Schmidt. Um, so my question, you know, having these two worlds in, in, in mind, so having these very, very different uh, approaches to digitization and having this kind of very different political uh, agendas that are in place comparing different African countries and China, and then kind of in the middle, you know, what's our maybe vision um, for an alternative agenda? So could we have a different narration um, focusing on the inclusive digital society, so not widening the digital gaps as we saw it in the, in the examples of, of the African countries and not having this kind of total uh, loss of privacy and civil rights. And um, we are working a bit on those kinds of technologies and these are just kind of little, tiny little steps but it is um, my understanding of these bottom-up approaches to empowerment, to do, your, do it yourself technologies uh, that might be, um, show the pathway to an alternative agenda. So one of the projects that we are doing on the European level is MAZI, that is uh, the Greek term for together. And uh, the question was, you know, program or be programmed, the implications of small data, local content, and do-it-yourself technologies. And there was a big uh, consortium of different European partners. Um, for example, the Open University was part of it, uh, Edinburgh, um, different um, initiatives from, uh, from Greece, from Zurich, from London, and so on. And the basic uh, idea is to provide local, uh, so the technology and the processes for local peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. So it's kind of an alternative uh, or complementary structure to the internet because it's an intranet. So kind of local network, and it's really easy. It's just based on a Raspberry Pi. It's an open source software that is uh, quite cheap. And we had a whole um, community development process where we are thinking about, you know, if we have a community, also for example, like uh, Technion, uh, or like your neighborhood at home, you know, what kind of data do we want to share? And where should the data be stored? And what's our exchange purpose? And what do we want to do together? So what's kind of our, network society in a different sense, maybe in a social sense. And that was a really interesting uh, process. So we did this uh, in, in Berlin, with, in Berlin Kreuzberg. So this is a community gardening project. And uh, Stadt von Unten means, you know, creating the city on our own. So a bottom-up strategy to create our neighborhood. So it's kind of regaining also power from the ground. And then we had different kind of workshops saying, you know, how do we want to create our own city, our own infrastructure, our own sharing culture and infrastructures, and, uh, and what does this mean, and what kind of uh, technologies should be involved. And um, then we were setting up this neighborhood network with this Mazi zone, that is called, and then um, it, uh, um, it, has a diff it has a toolkit of different uh, software solutions that are all open source, for example, an Etherpad, so it's uh, compared to Google Docs, but it's in, um, open source, so you can collaboratively work on a document. You've got a local cloud storage, the next cloud. You've got a guest book, um, a frame, frame of data, so a data analytics uh, environment. You've got a WordPress blog to create your own blog entries and so on. So it comes uh, together as a package. You can download 
uh, all the stuff uh, free from the internet, and then just uh, understand that it's uh, it's it's a it's a community-owned infrastructure. It is cheap. It is open source. It's about sharing. Um, and it is a kind of empowerment of people to create their own stuff, so to own the technology, to own uh, the data. The data is just locally stored. So you cannot uh, access Facebook, for example, through this uh, int uh, intranet, through this network, but it's complementary. It is a different approach to the network, just to have a case of you know, creating alternatives. So we are discussing very much, of course, about digital commons, so you know, what kind of sharing and uh, you know, common infrastructures could we have as communities. We're talking about platform cooperatives that have a cooperative model of sharing um, the, uh, the revenue streams, of sharing the resources, of sharing the technology, about the equality of access. How should we create these kinds of um, access points so that everybody uh, can really understand the value of the network, empowering people also to how to use it be able to program these kinds of very simple tools and use it for their own agenda and community. There's a whole uh, discourse, of course, about these ones. For example, uh, Aram Bartol with the stat drops, <laughs> so very nice, uh, very local file sharing server that he is just putting into the wall. Um, or also, which is very nice, the Freifunk Initiative uh, here in Berlin. Uh, this is they are giving uh, Wi-Fi access for free, and they are just you know using local rooftops just to provide with uh, the antenna, and then you can just use the Freifunk uh, Wi-Fi network because the public authority is not, why ever, able to provide Wi-Fi in Berlin. And, um, and these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer networks are very resilient. It's very interesting. So for example, the Athens Metropolitan Wireless Network is one of the biggest ones uh, worldwide. So peer-to-peer -peer networks just you know, create the network from one mobile phone point to the other, for example. So from one peer to the other peer. So they don't need a, a centralized uh, structure. And these resilient infrastructures are also very helpful, for example, when there is a kind of a natural catastrophe, like an earthquake or whatever. These kind of infrastructures are still working working when all the other uh, uh, things are um, having a blackout because they are not depending on a centralized infrastructure, but they are decentralized. So this is a wonderful alternative with these kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks and creating this kind of stuff. So you can just uh, use it. The mazizone.eu project is on GitHub, so you can just download it and just uh, play around with it and maybe create in your own neighborhood this kind of alternative neighborhood uh, network to understand uh, the implications of this kind of sharing. In the design research lab, so we are working with very different tools on social design with also of course participatory design processes where we invite the different stakeholders and we are very much uh, engaged into social and political agencies. Also what uh, Bianca was mentioning uh, yesterday with these examples that we are working on and try to understand uh, our role in these kinds of um, complex um, yeah, social material infrastructures, as we call it. And we were creating very different kinds of tools and tool sets for giving access to people and understanding also the ramifications that maybe I don't have a computer at home or maybe I don't know how to use the smartphone. And then we use, for example, audio interfaces or uh, Bianca created this beautiful lullaby box, which is uh, displayed here on the right-hand side, where you can sing, a, sing along your lullaby from your childhood uh, on a touch uh, pad and you can mark your, the, the point where you come from and then you get a kind of mapping of all these kinds of cultural heritage and all these narrations that are stored in lullabies. So having really different media and different access points uh, for people to become part of these kind of communities, this is one of our big topics. So it's very much about the challenge of the ownership of uh, these infrastructures and of the participation. So who can participate, uh, who has technological access, but also social access. Um, how do we include people with diverse backgrounds? And this challenge of the very first steps of creating awareness, so really getting people on board. I think these are some very important points for us as the designers of new technologies. And one last uh, chapter about, of course, it's very much creating awareness it runs through digital education. So how do we empower children already to be future architects of our digital society? So how do we convey these ideas? And uh, to be honest, in Germany, digital education is just a mess. So it's just not happening on a school level. 
I don't know why, but uh, we just leave out this digital stuff. And I think that many teachers and politicians still think that the, at some point in time, the internet will you know, go away again. So it's maybe just a temporary phenomenon. So, but uh, I believe maybe it's not the case. So maybe we should start to do something. And that's why I created a little a non-for-profit startup. It's called uh, Calliope. And we just made a mini computer for uh, third year graders. We developed it uh, open source. It's based Based on the microbit, you might be familiar with the microbit. It's uh, this was founded in the UK, and we created a version that is uh, more adaptable to even younger children. So on the uh, at the level of uh, third grade, so kind of seven or eight year old ones, uh, to teach uh, digital education in elementary school already. And the first reactions we started 2016 were very positive on the media. So they said this computer could uh, re revolutionize uh, the elementary school or the school system itself. So really start something off because all this stuff that we are providing is open educational resources. So it's all for free uh, on the internet. And yeah, it's just a kind of microcontroller like Raspberry Pi or like Arduino, but uh, for school children, it has many very cool features. It has a microphone and different kinds of sensors on it, so you can just start programming it. And it's based on, uh, on Scratch and on Blockly. You can use the kind of uh, current available open source tools to really easy be able uh, to, to get your first uh, experiences in coding. And it's really fun. So um, we were fundraising uh, lots of money and we are giving it to free to elementary school levels. We have produced 100,000 pieces now and are uh, throughout Germany we are very well uh, underway now. So many school children just learned how to code now already and we are also training the teachers because this is very important. But we have now also um, some first pilot studies in Moscow, in uh, Uzbekistan, in Mexico, so in really different parts of the world and uh, try to get this community up and running from the bottom. So um, this is also a very pragmatic approach from my side. So um, yeah, to sum up a bit, so what are the implications for us, for our research and development uh, agenda it, in, in those uh, academic uh, institutions that we are working in, but also in our private kinds of neighborhoods? What is the implications in terms of policy making and what can we as designers and developers do? So um, we are part of the Weizenbaum Institute for the Networked uh, Society. And uh, th this is a big uh, publicly funded research institute with 20 different research groups. You can check it out uh, online, the Weizenbaum Institute. This is very, uh, um, it's very interesting because it's so interdisciplinary. So we have very different uh, research topics like you know, how to pay with data, what are the legal uh, constraints and implications, what is the new understanding of digital citizenship. Um, we have the two groups of the maker culture, the production possibilities of digital maker cultures, and we have the other one which is uh, headed by Bianca, which is about digital sovereignty and equality and inequality of access. And so um, very, very different approaches. And uh, it's also always a tough fight with all the different um, uh, disciplines. So, you know, we as designers were sneaking in this kind of excellent research cluster, and we do this kind of weird stuff that we are doing, but uh, still they accept us, and they, I think they started liking us, actually. And this is very nice to really engage uh, on eye level uh, with social scientists, with uh, people from um, engineering background, with uh, legal guys, with all these kind of different disciplines disciplines because I think we need this holistic approach to address these overall questions that I was just raising. And the Weizenbaum Institute is just part of a big uh, um, scientific landscape that we were building up in the recent years. So I think it took kind of 10 years for Berlin to come up with this, but it's really, really uh, worth it uh, because the results are very um, tempting. So we have on the left on the left hand side the Weizenbaum Institute, which is part of uh, the University of the Arts and Technical University of Berlin and all the other Berlin universities, so um, Humboldt University, Freie University, and so on. So all the big players are on board. And then on the right hand side, we have the Einstein Center Digital Future. And there also all the universities uh, are part of it, but it's a complementary model. The Einstein Center Digital Future created in two years 50 new professorships 
in a public-private partnership model. So the model is we search for a donor, so this could be an, uh, a society or um, uh, a company or an NGO or whatever, who um, proposes um, a research topic on digitization, so mobile cloud computing or wearable computing or data sovereignty. And then they give two-thirds of the funding, and the Berlin Senate gives the, the, the rest of it and some additional resources. And this model is very convenient. And these are all assistant professorships uh, that were donated for six years. And uh, in this model, it is really easy to scale up fast new topics. So um, if you are interested in that, check out the website. The governance model is, is displayed uh, there uh, very much in detail, because we want to act, have this acting as a role model to scale up and to complement uh, research institutions with these kinds of public-private partnership models. So we have two big institutions in Berlin talking about digital society and coming up with those kinds of models. And then we are also, um, uh, as mentioned before, talking about digital sovereignty. What are the ramifications? You know, what's the technological um, uh, ramifications? What's the regulatory aspect? And what's also the digital competencies that we need to put in place to let people be uh, sovereign in a digital society, to have the freedom of choice, self-determination, self-control, and security? So as a community, I think we have the chance to strive for a different version of the digital society as I try to showcase based on openness, transparency, accessibility, and civil rights. And I think we are able to develop the technologies, the processes, and the whole ecosystem in this kind of spirit. We are able to educate the people how to live in a digital society. And I think that we also together with our colleagues and students and families and friends should reflect on these kind of ramifications where we are heading towards. And I think part of uh, this agenda should be an open science approach, so sharing our resources, sharing also the visions, and also engage into policy making. So I think that we as researchers today have to do this, because when I see you know, what from the political players and from the political parties, what they are sharing in terms of a digital vision, so I'm just out of the game, so this is not, you are, are you kidding me? So, so we really should uh, engage there and also share our experiences there. Uh, what's, the, um, what's our positive vision, maybe our utopia, but we are also able to design our utopia and make it a bit more reality. That's from my side. Thank you so much.